to the seventh session of the conference, which is Frames in Flux, Worlding Memories and Cinematic Tales of Trauma. The rapporteur for this session is Samaya Ru Rumi, who is a PhD scholar at the Department of English, Jamia Milia Islamia. And the chair for the session is Zehra Rizbi. Zehra is a PhD scholar at the Department of English, Jamia Milia Islamia. She works in the field of cultural studies, utopia, dystopian studies, digital humanities, and game studies. She is the co-founder of Digra India. She was a Fulbright Nehru doctoral fellow at Yale University and Ministry of Education Spark Fellow at Michigan State University. She has delivered lectures at Yale, MSU, JMI, and DU. Her work has been published in several online and print journals. Over to you, Zahra, for chairing the session. Thank you so much, Stephen, for the very kind introduction. I'm so glad to be here chairing the session, which has so many themes that also speak to my own work and just research in general that I'm interested in. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce the first presenter of this session, Natasha Negi, who is a PhD scholar um, at IIT, at II Science Education and Research Bhopal, um, who's paper is titled Understanding Intersections of Caste, Gender and Migration in Uttarakhand Through Cinematic Representations of Trauma and Memory. Over to you, Natasha. Hello, am I audible? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Zaira. So I'll begin with the presentation now. Uh, I'll just uh, share the PPT. Um, I don't know why it's not uh, showing. It's only showing the options to be shared online. Is she the co-host, uh, Samia? Uh, you should be able to share this. Natasha, we can see your screen. Okay, so uh, now if I open, uh, can you see the PPT? Yeah, we can see the slides. Okay, okay, great. Is it still visible? Yes, very much. Okay, thank you so much. I hope it's also um, moving. It, it's moving, right? Yes, yes, it is. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Sorry for the time. So I'll just begin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, in the Acts of Memory by Iqbal, he explains, I quote, traumatic events in the past have a persistent presence, which explains why that presence is usually discussed in terms of memory as traumatic memory, unquote. Good afternoon, distinguished chair member, respected faculty members and organizers and fellow participants. The title of my presentation is Understanding Intersections of Caste, Gender and Migration in Uttarakhand through cinematic representations of trauma and memory. In the paper, I analyze the intersections of caste, gender, and memory studies. I particularly focus on how personal and collective memories intersect and depict the trauma perpetuated by the social inequalities practiced in Uttarakhand, India. Now, I will discuss the critical analysis of the film Dev Bhumi. The film Dev Bhumi is directed by the Serbian director Goran Pasilvic. The film was premiered in 2016 at the 41st Toronto International Film Festival and is an Indo-Serbian joint film venture shot in Uttarakhand. The story is set in the rural Garhwal region of the northern Indian state of Uttarakhand. The film is a homecoming tale that highlights the lingering caste and gender prejudice in rural Indian culture. The film revolves around the protagonist Rahul Negi, 
who returns from exile in England to his village after four decades. Rahul's return sets off commotion among the villagers who have not forgiven him for his intercaste relationship and consequent violence that occurred in the past. The storyline proceeds to disclose that the oppressive social rules of caste and gender, which made Rahul suffer, still exist in the village. His former lover, Maya, who is a lower caste Vadi, that is, a dancer woman, suffered after Rahul's exile. She was doubly outcasted by her family and villagers on the basis of caste and gender for breaking the rules of endogamy. The traumatic ostracization eventually turns her mad. The film also depicts deep-rooted gender inequality in the village through the girl Asha's subplot. She is the brightest student in her class, but is pulled out of school to get married at an early age. The forceful marriage pushes her to commit suicide later. And later, her brothers also burn the school building. The film further depicts how regional factors like environmental disasters also add to people's trauma. The child, Munna, became an orphan as he lost his parents in the 2013 Kedarnath floods. The film shows his constant longing for his lost home and family throughout the narrative. Thus, I want to analyze how the film critiques the social contestations in Uttarakhand by intersecting the personal memory and past of Rahul with the collective memory and lived present of the other characters. Next, the, in this section, I primarily discuss how the personal memory of the protagonist unfolds. The protagonist Rahul, an expat, returns to his village after being an incommunicado for 40 long years. The film portrays his nostalgic return through his observations of the native land. According to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, I quote, Nostalgia is defined as a wistful or sentimental yearning for return to or of some pa past period or irrevocable, sorry, irrecoverable, sorry, um, condition or as a state of being homesick, unquote. In the dramaturgies of erasure and returns on exile, nostalgia, and homecoming, Yana Mirzan also helps understand that, I quote, homecoming, however, does not produce cure for nostalgia. An exilic nostalgic can yearn for home, both being away and staying at home, unquote. Likewise, through the film's cinematic depiction, we can observe Rahul's homecoming is intact with a nostalgic return, such that he witnesses his native land as something which he has already lost. Through Rahul's vision, the camera depicts his longing for scenic beauty, the mountainous terrain, the views of the Himalayas, the forest, the village, its farms, walkways, and other commonly shared spaces. Thus, Rahul's personal memory and nostalgia for his homeland unfolds through the picturization of the relation between people and the lived native spaces. The narrative also uses Rahul's blurring eyesight as a metaphor to represent his desire to see his homeland once before he completely becomes blind. The blurring vision portrays Rahul's lifelong suffering due to coarse migration and successive loss of home. However, his personal me memory of the native land and his attempt to return to his village is followed by the collective memory of the villagers. Here, I also want to critique Pasovic's narrative, which completely overshadows and omits the memory of Maya, a lower caste woman, by singularly focusing on the memory of the protagonist Rahul, who is an upper caste man. The film rightly portrays how lo lower caste women like Maya and later even her niece, Darshini, uh, work as wadi or dancers to entertain people at social gatherings like weddings in the village. This casteist and gendered practice of low caste women working as dancers is common in India, and the women are known by different names in different parts of the country. For example, Murali in Maharashtra, Erpula in Andhra Pradesh, and Devdasi in other parts of India. Thus, Pasovic's 
a pacific aptly criticizes the caste based labor system especially for women which makes them vulnerable to sexual objectification and exploitation however he still obliterates the doubly traumatized memory of maya who was suppressed both on the basis of her caste and her gender we can observe that the film uses the method of flashbacks to reiterate the social ostracization faced by rahul but the narrative depicts that maya has probably lost her memory as she becomes mad due to the traumatic events she faced in the past so the film chooses neither to give any space to maya's memories nor any voice to her as she is literally shown to have suffered a loss of speech the film does not situate maya's dual caste gender based oppression and to add along with the society the film narrative too does not provide any means of agency to her thus it becomes essential to analyze the personal memory of the protagonist in the film text with the collective memories of other oppressed narratives to understand these issues better the next section is titled memory and trauma contestations and intersections morris holbock states that collective memories are a community's shared renderings of the past that help shape its collective identity in this section i focus on the intersection of the protagonist rahul's personal memory and the collective memories of the villagers about him maria pohan lugas also analyzes the relation between individual and collective practices of memory She explains how practices of memory are a characteristic of social relations and pervade societies. Similarly, I delineate how the intersection of personal and collective memories reveals the trauma perpetuated by existing social contestations in Uttarakhand. In the paper, I discuss that the intersections of personal and collective memories happen on two levels. So first i will discuss how rahul's personal memory of the village and homeland is contradicted by the collective memory of the villagers about him lugas examines that i quote the practice of individual memory is considered both as not independent of the past and present and as something that is in constant interaction with collective memories unquote In the same lines I want to emphasize how the protagonist Rahul's personal is also not independent of the past and is affected by the constant interplay with the collective memories of his family and community while Rahul is overwhelmed to be back in his homeland he is equally unwelcomed by the villagers and even by his family members The film recalls through a series of past events that Rahul was compelled to leave his village as he was caught in an inter-caste rivalry because of his relationship with Maya. So when he returns Rahul's brother and some other villagers oppose his stay and want him punished for the duel and consequent uh, violence that took place years ago. thus rahul suffering due to nostalgia for homeland and loss of home is further increased and triggered with the intersectional collective memory of the villagers for the villagers rahul is a culprit for breaking social norms of endogamy and thus he should still be punished by being outcast from his community and land thus on the first level rahul is made to relive the trauma of social exclusion along with the longing for home further i would like to focus on the second level of intersection of personal and collective memories to discuss the social contestations in uttarakhand while on the first level we observe contradictions on the second level we can observe what kai erickson explains as quote unquote traumatized communities In his work Notes on Trauma and Community he explains that I quote trauma shared can serve as a source of communality it can happen that otherwise unconnected persons who share a traumatic experience seek one another out and develop a form of fellowship on the strength of that common tie unquote Likewise in the paper I observe how Rahul finds a traumatized community among other people from his village who have also suffered due to caste and gender biases since the personal is defined by the collective 
The intersection of these memories depict how other people like Rahul also suffer similar trauma of uprootedness and social exclusion. Thus, to add to Erickson, I want to emphasize that the formation of what he calls the traumatized communities can be understood better by analyzing this intersection of personal and collective memories. The narrative explores how, like Rahul, other characters like the mad woman and Rahul's low caste lover Maya, the young bride Asha who commits suicide, and Munna, an orphan child, are also traumatized due to the social and regional contestations in their native land. In the traditional trauma theory pioneered by Kathy Karod, trauma is viewed as an event that fragments consciousness and prevents direct linguistic representation. The model draws attention to the severity of suffering by suggesting the traumatic experience, uh, how it damages the psyche. In the film, we can observe the traumatic fragmentation of the psyche and disruption of the normal as the characters face the tropes of memory backflashes, chronic head pangs, constant fainting, madness, and even suicide. Moreover, the traumatic anguish of the victims is represented through the imagery or figurative language of fire. So as we can see in this slide, apart from uh, in the first picture where Adash, the protagonist... you have two minutes to conclude. Okay, okay. So these are the uh, three prominent scenes. Next... Uh... So, uh, Pasilvik has also represented the protagonist's trauma through the environmental destruction of his native land. In the starting scenes itself, uh, the camera displays Rahul's traumatic frame of mind through the damaged mountains. The film also highlights Rahul's nostalgia and showcases his feelings of loss of home through the literal ruins of houses in Garhwal region of uh, Uttarakhand. And uh, not going too much uh, into details. So, um, so towards the end, the film juxtaposes, juxtaposes trauma and hope through the picturization of environmental destruction. The end scene of the film puts across its message of hope. The devastated terrain of the Himalayas as a result of the 2013 floods is paralleled to the long-standing Kedarnath temple as an indicator of hope over trauma. And the film ends with the unification of Rahul and Munna across the background of the long-standing Kedarnath temple. Um, and in the end, though Rahul loses his eyesight as a metaphor for uh, suffered trauma of ostracization and longing for home, but before he leaves the village for good, he decides to help re-establish the school in the village where young children like Munna and Asha can aspire for a better future. This education and the child Munna become a beam of hope for people like Rahul, Maya and Asha and also Munna who have long suffered the trauma caused by social discriminations and environmental destruction. Uh, the film ends with the hopeful poetic lines from Gitanjali written by Rabindranath Tagore. So, uh, although I know I'm like a bit short of time, but I had also uh, kept uh, just a two-minute uh, clip. So I hope it's visible. So I'll just play uh, it. Also, in this scene, we can see how the two lovers meet and without much conversation, they share, uh, you know, uh, how their traumatic uh, memories or traumatic past um, uh, has caused, uh, you know, the suffering to them. While one is going to become blind, the other uh, has lost speech. So I'll just play it. Ma'am. 
मैं मेरी तरफ देख मी मी अब सदानी को अंधू होने वाली हूं मी मी फिर कभी तेरे मुंह नहीं देख सका मैं मेरी तरफ एक माया so that was all about it and uh, also you know how uh, the film plays the role that in the scene there's a yeah. lot of darkness Natasha, and it's uh, yeah. clearly we, we are like, little uh, short of time yes. thank you so much for uh, you know playing the clip thank you so much thank you so much natasha it was a really interesting and uh, well presented paper as well um so there's so much i really want to talk about and while steven uh, collects a couple of questions maybe i can offer what i really liked and also some areas where i really want to hear more from you because i could tell that you had to skip a lot of the uh, media yeah. sections uh, that you wanted to discuss um of course i really enjoyed the way you were able to bring out levels in terms of theorizations from pon lagas or erickson i want to talk about another level which you touched on and maybe you can talk a bit more about it is the level of the camera and uh, the memorization that happens through watching from like dev dev bhumi for example uh, which is already about memory and there are several layers already which you've discussed uh, i want to talk about the effect of the camera lens on memory and also on what the audience perceives as memory while acknowledging the camera as a memory support which is very much entrenched in the visual yeah just uh, give me a minute sure so um there are uh, two things so like in my paper as uh, like i've discussed more in detail that you know uh, how there is this term of prosthetic memory which i've discussed in detail that how you know uh, when we are uh, watching the film so so how cinema helps not just create memory in this in the sense that it's not just that protagonist memory but when uh, you know like other uh, people or audiences like i am a, a native of uttarakhand but let's say if anyone else like for example i uh, you know screened just a clip to everyone here so everyone uh, you know uh, kind of it becomes a prosthetic prosthetic memory for everyone as in everyone empathizes uh for that situation or for those problems so i think that is something very essential that cinema brings in uh to you know uh, in order to understand these um situations or these issues and the the trauma and suffering and pain and you know so this is one um way to look at it and other thing is of course uh, as you said about camera lens so um you know uh, uh, like um from the starting uh, we see uh, that The, uh, like there are two very um, you know um, uh, like uh, very apparent uh, like um, shots um, or or how should i say like work of light and darkness which is uh, played in the movie for example you know uh, like when whenever the uh, protagonist is feeling nostalgia so it's mostly you know like the the bright um you, uh, what should i say the bright picture or the himalayas or the sunlit uh, you know um feels but uh, when when the trauma part of it is uh, shown more so as i address like through fire it's address you know like um, uh, that play of darkness and the the fire burning within them like the suffering and the trauma burning within them so th that is how i think also um 
you know the, uh, the the camera or the play of light and darkness helps uh, understand especially uh, through uh, like a uh, cinematic work um, the the pro uh, the problems of uh, you know tra uh, trauma or nostalgia or loss of home thank you so much natasha like i said brilliant paper and i really also could uh, sense that the screenshots you've picked up uh, were able to bring across a lot of what you just said light dark the camera direction seems to be amazing and you've got it yeah. out really well yeah. thank you so much also you know there was uh, another clip that uh, i had thought but due to lack of time i did not play so that uh, clip also um, so this one showed you know the caste gender uh, uh, like how you can understand caste gender through memory studies through their trauma but uh, there was another clip uh, where we can see how uh, you know you can understand the uh, like as i said like how the personal and the collective uh, interact so how the child munna who is in uh, who who is an orphan who has lost his parents in the kedarnath floods so his um, you know trauma or his longing for home is interconnected with uh, rahul so uh, munna takes uh, rahul to a place you know where uh, the river ganga is flowing and then he starts uh, you know throwing pebbles in the river and then he uh, tells uh, him that you know uh, in that sense that um, you know i can like his trauma is brilliantly explained in that uh, scene where he you know he's he's throwing his uh, you know furious at the river for taking away his parents lives and then he start, he uh, tells uh, rahul that he can talk to his parents spirits so th that kind of you know regional factor is also very much there in the film you know where it's believed that you know you can um, like there are traditions where you invoke spirits but how the director has put uh, incorporated it is like uh, he what that child does is because it's so traumatic you know uh, he he stands up on a rock and then he starts echoing uh, he starts calling calling his mom and uh, uh, like since the echo is coming back he he tells rahul that i am able to talk with my parents see i am able to talk and that kind of you know a suffering that a little child goes and uh, and towards the end we see how this relationship transforms is that rahul uh, you know opens the school uh, for munna and then they unite at the kidana temple and he he tells uh, rahul tells him that see here he heaven and earth meet so it's kind of you know like what i um, Uh, analyzed is that earth probably meant the traumatic experiences and heaven probably meant the hope so both uh, through the intersection of you know uh, the, uh, the 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 personal and the collective memory and forming of this tra traumatized community we do get a sense of hope so yeah i hope i was able to explain it thank you so much natasha i believe due to time restraints we really need to move to the next one but steven will be able to forward any questions that are there for you Thank you so Thank much you once much. again. Thank you. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our next presenter, who is Sanya Muzambu, uh, an MPhil scholar from University of Delhi, and whose paper is titled "War and Memory: Remembering Women's Bodies in War Through a Reading of Brian De Palma's Casualties of War." Over to you, Sanya. Hi. uh i hope i'm audible yes and uh, yeah i'll just share my screen yeah is it visible ah uh, is my screen visible not yet not yet not yet just a second i'm not able to um, share my screen for some reason i'm really sorry so i'll just get to the presentation yeah <laughs> so uh 
Thank you for the introduction, Zero. Uh, before coming to my paper, I would like to foreground my arguments on a few assertions. The first being that uh, memory is as old as the history of life. The moment the first living cell came into origin, memory began with it. Every movement, every action for its sustenance was an act of memorialization. The, remembering the sources of food, the location of a predator, the water bodies, was pivotal to continuing life on this planet. However, as human civilizations progressed and societies originated and spread, the idea of memory became complex and its study complicated further. What I want to convey here is that memory studies as a discipline might be recent, but human species, just like other living creatures, are beings of memory. My second foregrounding is that for all species, uh, the, the struggle for life has been rampant with violence. However, human history, compared to other species, is marked with a greater and a strategic form of violence or war. Since we are here to contextualize and converse about the global south, a term which itself originated in the academic circles of the United States, we can therefore enforce a binary between the global north and south in terms of imperialistic or colonial violence. This brings me to my third assertion that the history of violence is also a history of a pursuit of resources. Every living being is wired to accumulate the maximum number of resources for a sense of security and chances of survival. However, human colonialism has throughout history been masqueraded as a civilizing mission towards the other who is, who is racially different from the dominant colonizer, which for the most part has been the white European male. Since the white man has masked these economic pursuits as rescue missions to save the other from, the, from their own savagery, all kinds of violence have been justified with impunity and for the most part are recorded and excluded from the historical narratives. My final assertion is that these historical narratives have been controlled and constructed through a Eurocentric perspective, enabling and normalizing even the most tragic acts of violence towards the other. The vital task of memory studies then becomes to create a counter-resistance to the homogenizing of the West-centric narratives, subverting the gaze to not only restore back the power of representation to the colonized body, but to also bring to account the colonizer for the violent and traumatic acts of the past. However, it remains a bitter fact that even in the post-colonial imagination, memories of the global South that are not our own remain inaccessible to us for various reasons. And hence, in any attempt to know these memories, we have little choice but to handpick narratives by the West that shed some light on the experiences of the witness in some form. For my paper today, I have done the same, remaining well aware of the problematic paradigm of doing so. The act of archival is a complicated one, and one has to grab any straw one can, giving these buried stories any chance of revival, if at all. Keeping these points in mind, I will today be presenting a paper titled War and Memory, Remembering Women's Bodies in War through a reading of Brian De Palma's Casualties of War. So since uh, the slides are not visible, uh, I would like to begin with a line from Stanley Kubrick's uh, 1987 film, Full Metal Jacket, uh, where a soldier says, uh, this is my rifle, this is my gun, this is for fighting, this is for fun, as the soldiers hold their weapons for rifle and the genitals for gun. The memorializations of gendered violence in war continue to be marginal, especially in cinematic texts. While most of the representations fall into mainstream canonical portrayals, they also provide entry points to confront the violent memories of war. One such retelling of an event of a Vietnamese woman facing unimaginable violence at the hands of the US soldiers is Brian De Palma's 1989 film, Casualties of War. The film is essentially in the form of a flashback where the protagonist, a Vietnam War veteran, recalls the violent rape and the subsequent murder of a young Vietnamese girl by his platoon members, who have been deployed on a routine recon mission into the contested terrain of communist Vietnam. The memorialization of this violent incident portrays how women often bear a disproportionate cost in wars. While most war films portray violent scenes situated in battlefields, 
casualties of war depicts how war extends beyond geographical boundaries to claim its victims the paper shall attempt to study the politics of representation of gendered violence in war through the prism of memory and will be an attempt at illuminating the disparities in representation and remembering the trauma of vietnamese people and paving a way forward towards problematizing the existing processes that govern the creation of historical narratives as pierre vidal said memory is the only antidote to historical error and grounding my arguments and my paper on astrid earl's arguments about the power of fiction as media of cultural memory i would like to uh, briefly talk about the introduction uh, i would like to briefly introduce the um, vietnam war in america uh, us war in vietnam so brad west in uh, war memory and commemoration rights in the 40 years since the fall of saigon the vietnam war has been a key site for thinking about the power of commemoration practices much has been written about the social and psychological consequences of the conflict being marginalized with an established western trad traditions of remembrance later attempts to incorporate the war within remembrance traditions provided an important platform for theorizing innovative commemorative practices and the dynamics of collective memory in an era of cultural plurality and conflict unquote This is an attempt to deconstruct the interstices created by war and the subsequent inevitable violence emanating from it. War violence, which is largely gendered in nature, gets embedded in various forms of memories, ways and processes of remembering and retelling. When one looks at conflicts with regard to South Asian geographical spaces and cultures, it becomes pertinent to note how the constructions of memory narratives tend to be best centric and overlook the experiences of the other war memory narrated by the western media not only otherizes but in the process also dehumanizes the victim of such wars more specifically the female body one might be tempted to reject the western narratives altogether in their pursuit of more authentic representation but has little choice but to rely on the very few western narratives that attempt to undo the appropriation of the native victims voice and agency to retell their own stories this approach undeniably scaffolds the west centric representational structures and hegemonic processes of narrative creation and historicization but in doing so also opens up some entry points for the english speaking readership and emerging scholars to look at conflicts that they are not directly a part of and understand and critique the processes and problematics of memory creation and propagation with regard to the vietnam war and its american cinematic representations earlier films like deer hunter apocalypse now platoon born on the 4th of july as well as the more recent ones like tropic thunder the five bloods draw vivid pictures of this war however mostly through the lens of the american soldiers There are only a handful of films like Heaven on Earth and a documentary titled The No Time for Tears that attempt to shine the light on the women's place in this war, locating their bodies and identifying and memorializing their trauma. The paper focuses on the mapping of Vietnamese women's bodies in war situations and the presence or absence of memory creation and remembrance through uh, Pama's uh, text as a form of memory text. a medium for retelling of a violent gendered event of the vietnam war in the form of a flashback the film provides a suitable entry point to look at gender based violence in conflict zones unlike uh, unlike other celluloid narratives on the vietnam war which are overwhelmingly action packed and rush forward along a linear path pama's film puts one brutal event in the center stage going back in the narrator's mind to a brutal event in the past before coming back to the present with a jolt in doing so it creates a space for the audience to suspend the expectations of how of the creation of memory narratives which are not homogeneous processes but rather complex entangled structures intertwining what one remembers with the silences of the victim when one watches casualties of war and its representation of male behavior in war time which symbolizes an almost dionysian frenzy there's a feeling of contradiction with all other vietnam war narratives which are almost synonymous with their obsession to present an almost video game like battlefield with machine guns and guerrilla weapons cutting down young american bodies 
but this heart-wrenching brotherhood and nostalgia for home exists as a mere secondary narrative in casualties of war. The primary backdrop being of gendered horror against the Vietnamese woman's body. The center is taken up by a single event of a Vietnamese woman's kidnapping, torture, rape and murder by a platoon of American soldiers. Casualties of War is a cinematic adaptation of a 1969 New Yorker article by Daniel Lang. Lang reported a true event referred to as the incident on Hill 192 from the Vietnam War wherein four soldiers are out on a scouting mission with their sergeant. The sergeant gives a whimsical order for the kidnapping and raping of a young Vietnamese girl, Phan Thi Mao, from a village for the purpose of some rest and relaxation. The instance of the heartbreaking kidnapping is followed by brute torture of the horrified girl, physical and mental, at the hands of the soldiers who rape her one by one, not for sexual pleasure, but for their sadistic release. This intersection of war and gendered violence in the memory narrative uh, is done by Pama as he begins the film with Max Erickson's character on a train years after the incident when seeing a Vietnamese woman suddenly triggers a flashback in his mind of the violent incident he had inadvertently been a part of. Through this technique, Bama manages to take us back to the Vietnam War. And as Erickson relives the painful incidents, the audience is introduced to the gendered horrors that the ideas of conflict and war incorporate within themselves. It becomes noteworthy that flashbacks which are a form of analysis, are not an arbitrary collection of memories, but theorized mnemonic tools. Palmer does not resort to narrating the incident through a set of memories interrupting the main plot. Rather, the flashback transports the whole setting to the violent past, indicating that such events cannot merely be reflected upon, but can, but can and are relived again and again. The whole film is a flashback with the present state of Erickson's life being mere props to hold the violent memory together. As we watch the tragedy unfold in Erickson's mind through the flashback on the moving train, it might appear to be a singular violent incident. However, Palma underlines this personal narrative with Sanya, the political Please point. try to conclude within one minute. Sure, one sure, sure. Yeah, I'll just take uh, Palmer underlines this uh, personal narrative with a political one, that of rape and gendered violence. As Gina Messina Desert explains in Rape and Spiritual Death of the cultural tendency to confuse rape with sex, rather than recognizing it as a brutal exercise of power and control. The rape of local women by the occupying military groups is an open strategy employed to exert power over the population, making rape a weapon of war. It should not be read as a tale of right and wrong, of Erickson versus his brutish unit. Rather, it is just a canvas where war plays out, violating everything that comes in its way. So um, there's a lot, there are a lot of other uh, sections in the paper, but I'll just conclude uh, by comparing the film with uh, De Palma's another film um, titled Redacted of 2007, which narrativizes the Mahmoudia killings of 2006 in uh, Mahmoudia era where a girl is raped and subsequently killed along with her entire family. So such narratives do not seek to recall or document single independent incidents and experiences of violence. Rather, they highlight the gendered structure of war machinery with sexual violence being an indispensable weapon for the army. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanya. This was a really well put together paper as well. And I already know uh, this is going to excite a lot of questions. So even though I do have a few of my own, maybe I will let our moderator, Stephen, uh, post any questions he has or share any questions that he has collected from the chat. So Sanya, I'll take one question, which is there. Um, how does casualties of war critique the white soldier's gaze towards the Vietnamese female other, the way you mentioned, revealing the film's exploration of neo-imperial practices? territorial acquisitions and racism. And what does this reveal in general about the complicity of the broader Western war machinery? Uh, so uh, as we watch the film, and uh, since Erickson is shown to be the hero, the good character, uh, but when we look at his behavior, when we look at his treatment of uh, the Vietnamese, young Vietnamese girl on, uh, we see that he almost treats her like a fragile 
bird that has been hurt so he does, because he cannot understand the language because he cannot he cannot relate to the culture he tries to communicate but then the processes of othering the subtle processes of othering can be seen in his treatment of her as a very delicate mm. almost a subhuman character that he is just there to take care of that he's just there to protect and he beyond that there is there is no agency that is being uh, accorded uh, to the to the vietnamese girl uh, and also talking about the war machinery so the casualties of war even though there is al- almost uh, a justification of whatever is going on even by the director himself but uh, not talking about that but um, when 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 uh, erickson tries and takes uh, some tries to take some action to sort of bring to justice his platoon members we are see we are kind of shown uh, an almost step by step conformity on on part of the whether it's the authorities whether it's it's his seniors or whether it's his own platoon members who almost try to kill him uh that, that we are seen this we are shown this complicity by the whole war machinery that is there in place again this this rape becomes a mission this rape becomes a sort of a sort of an exercise in discipline where uh, the platoon members are almost tested for their loyalty towards the sergeant so uh the the vietnamese other the female body of the vietnamese woman is not seen as a, as a woman it's not seen as a human it's just seen as a as as an enemy terrain that is to be captured so okay. yeah i mean sanya there are more questions that are there but i think i'll just post it to you personally on the chat box and then you can reply it to everyone on the chat box so okay. that will be Thank a better so way to do it right yeah now. and i'm so sorry i couldn't share the screen for some reason it's okay sanya maybe next time um i am very happy to introduce our last speaker of the session farsana musa kapil who is a phd scholar at pukoya thangal memorial government college kerala she will be speaking on unveiling alterity exploring the palestinian and israeli multifaceted memories identities and geopolitics through select children's films over to you farsana okay i hope i'm audible yes good evening to all uh thank you for the introduction zara uh, i would like to share my screen uh yeah we can see you okay yeah. so my study is titled as the unveiling alterity exploring the palestinian and israeli uh, um, uh, multifaceted memories identities and geopolitics through select children's movies so um, uh, as an introduction uh, let's look into the multilayered palestinian and israeli memory and identity Researches on memory representations have a significant impact on how the modern local and global communities structure their thoughts. The study attempts to explore the wide spectrum of Israeli and Palestinian related multi-layered memories, spaces, identities, experiences and emotions addressed through the children's film representations of post millennium. It delves into the politics of memory construction shedding light on the ethics and morality in remembering forgetting and reimagining the genocide memories of the bygone event holocaust and the ongoing event nakba by the israelites and palestinians it emphasizes the need for a more comprehensive understanding of the equal significance of human suffering through portrayals of un- disturbing ethnopolitical experiences of children this research explores how select post millennium children's films address the palestinian and israeli memory ethnic identity and geopolitics in the context of three events that is holocaust the partition of uh, mandatory palestine or the formation of uh, israeli state and the ongoing nakba the study aims to openly discuss and challenge uh, the politics and power dynamics involved in the construction of national memory and identity 
The formation of Israeli and Palestinian identities is a complex and ongoing process, deeply intertwined and marked by these pivotal events. The gradual recognition and relevance given to the Holocaust memories, followed by institutionalization of them, led to the proliferation of ideas related to cosmopolitan moralities about human rights, dominating in the late 20th century. At the same time, Nakba became a counter narrative that was sidelined in the name of struggle for survival of Holocaust victims. Um, it also discusses two parallel counter narratives. One is Nakba, the Palestinian ethnic cleansing and displacement. And the second one is Israeli War of Independence, the formation of the state of Israel. The above observations implies that Palestinians and Israelites saw the 1948 war as a formative event in their respective histories. These memories and experiences of the two nation states fills the social, cultural, and emotional milieu of the present generation. It leaves an indelible impression on their psyche and molds their later perceptions. Uh, when we trace the shift, uh, the shifting uh, nature or the uh, post-millennial films and the evolving portrayal of children, the shifting portrayal of children, we can see that the uh, this study traces the changes in the portrayal of children in the different post-millennial Israeli and Palestinian films that were produced in the different years of the past two decades to address the alterity in their identity representation. Uh, child protagonists in the films became heterotopic memory sites representing the Israeli and Palestinian struggle. It looks at the way they embody the plurality within collective memory, space, and identity. It ponders over the functions of juvenile protagonists and the way they are dynamically revised and reformed with the advent of 21st century. It also throws light at the impact of such representations on children and the politics behind it. Then when we look at uh, how the meanings uh, related to nation is produced, nation is considered as a product of cultural reproduction. Uh, in the post-colonial uh, post thinkers like Benedict Anderson and Homi K. Baba have defined nation as a product of cultural reproduction and its status is not rigid or static, but is continuously subjected to critical reflections, multiple perspectives and changes to envision a different future for a nation transcending the limitations of its past narratives. They redefined the notion of space from a fixed physical entity, which was prone to disposition or erasure, to a phenomenon which is dynamic, multidirectional, and that cannot be easily destroyed. For instance, Anderson in his book, Imagined Communities stated, I quote, nationalism has to be understood by aligning it not with self-consciously held political ideologies, but with large cultural systems that preceded it, out of which as well as against which it came into being, I unquote. Homi Baba began the introduction of his book Nation and Narration by stating, I quote, nations like narratives lose their origins in the midst of time and only fully, rea uh, fully realize their horizons in the mind's eye. The article explores how cultural reproductions via international cinema contributes to the regionalization and globalization of memory, creating opportunities to define or represent various communities and national identities globally. The late 20th and the 21st century cinematic expressions of genocide memories uh, depicted or they considered or pointed out the limitations of the homogenized collective memory and identity. They, uh, it led to the questioning of homogeneity in the victim and perpetrator representations. It highlighted the selective erasure and projection of certain memories. It tried to depict the multi-layeredness of ethnic identities and multi-directionality within the dominant memory narratives. 
and it helped in addressing marginalization of national social um, addressing marginalization of national, social, racial, religious, political, and other uh, minorities. Minorities. Then um, one thing that we should consider, that we should remember is the directors of Israeli and Palestinian movies had to face the contempt uh, two kinds of contemporary generation. The first one was those who simultaneously learn about it and experience and become traumatized by the ongoing Nakba genocide. And the second category of children are those who are instilled with the memories of past event, Holocaust, through the public narratives and academics. And at the same time, they also witness Nakba. Political violence often deliberately target civilians, including children, producing dangerous environments for the development or, uh, of, or healthy development of children. Uh, the four selected movies, I mean, the four select movies uh, for the study are The Little Traitor and Farah, which are two uh, feature films, and The Other Side and The Present are the two short films. The two feature films taken for study, The Little Traitor and Farah, are set in the background of pre- and post-Nakba, or the Israeli independence in 1940s. It addresses the traumatic experiences of the immigrant Israeli children and the native Palestinian children of the time, respectively. Lynn Roth's Israeli feature film, The, British, uh, the Little Traitor, is narrated from the perspective of a nine-year-old kid depicting the anxieties of the European Jewish migrants who started settling in mandatory Palestine, awaiting the formation of a new state of Israel. This is a Bildung's Roman that revolves around the life of a spirited boy, Jewish boy named Profi, and his unlikely friendship with a kind British soldier. Um, and uh, some of the key features or uh, critical issues which are discussed in this movie are uh, it's a product of imagination legitimized by adding footages and augmented statements. Then uh, Profi faces a dilemma of whether to accept knowledge indoctrinated or knowledge attained from his own experience. Then um, uh, there is selective depiction of history of European immigrants and, and neglecting Palestinian space in time. Then it asserts and promotes Israeli identity uh, through uh, using Hebrew language and culture and undermines the uh, indigenous Palestinian community who appear as minimal characters, uh, as, a few, as a few primitives wandering uh, in the premise. Though it is clearly evident that the movie is set in old Palestine, where Jews were immigrants, there are only very little appearances of Arabs, but depicting as coexisting with the immigrant Jews. They are portrayed as primitives. The young audience who watches the movie to learn history of Israel might believe the misconceptions that the Palestinian land was underpopulated, desolate, or in the notion that a land without people for a people without land, which was a phrase by uh, Diana Moore. Uh, the mainstream Israeli or American productions uh, uh, related to uh, Nakba or the uh, Israeli identity mostly misrepresented or asymmetrically presented or avoided representations of Palestinians denying their existence even in this 21st century. The Little Traitor is an example which showed no trace of Palestinian resistance during the period just before Nakba, when mandatory Palestine uh, invited Jewish migrants to the land. This film shows the independence of Israel, but not the realities of occupation of Palestinians. Uh, Darin J. Salam's Palestinian feature film Farah, which was screened in 2021, also presented from a child's point of view, 
set in the same time period as of the little traitor, worked as a counter narrative to it, as it exposes the stark realities of displacement, dispossession, and mass extermination of the indigenous Palestinians and occupation of their land during the 1948 Nakba. It also addressed the inherent racial and gender discriminations uh, perpetrated by the patriarchal community and military forces at that period through the eyes of the teenage girl Farah. The whole film is shot through Farah's lens who witnesses multiple incidents through a hole on the door behind which her father had locked her in their storeroom when the attack began. And some of the critical issues discussed in this movie, this uh, movie which is uh, based on real events in uh, Radhea's life uh, is some uh, some of the key fee, uh, fee uh, key um, what to say issues discussed are uh, the presence 1948 Nakba as a counter narrative to history of Israeli freedom uh, movement. Then it depicted displacement, dispossession, uh, as I uh, discussed earlier. Then Zionist military tortures and ethnic cleansing was portrayed very vividly through poignant scenes like showing the fate of a family being humiliated and brutally murdered. Then it discusses spatiocide and memory side faced by Palestinians even today. Then it discusses multiple political identities, like uh, the distinctions between victims, perpetrators, informants, and bystanders. Then it also uh, shows some key cultural elements, like uh, the key of the display, uh, key of the house from which Palestinian natives were displaced, their uh, head covering called kafeya and all. Uh, regarding the next two uh, films, uh, those are short films. The two short films, The Other Side, uh, which was trained in 2012, and The Present, uh, which came uh, in Netflix in 2020, are set in the present Israeli-Palestine, uh, focusing on the manifold identities that were produced after 1948, Nakba. The rise of Palestinian and Israeli nationalism and other subsequent consequences. So the first two films which I discussed is set in uh, 1940s. And the next two which I'm going to discuss uh, are, are set in the present. Uh, it discusses the effects of marginalization and the chronic conflicts, attacks or wars on children. The competing narratives of Israel and Palestine, the Holocaust, and the Nakba in these narrative reproductions through films play an important role in memorializing the past and present. Uh, Israeli director, Israeli director uh, Ken Shalin's short film, The Other Side, is the moving portrayal of a friendship that sprouts between two young boys on the Israeli and Palestinian side of the separation wall. The protagonist in the film uh, is an Israeli boy belonging to the kibbutz community. Kibbutz are believed to be a first Jewish community who arrived from the Eastern Europe in 1906. They were farmers and hoped for a collective living in the later period. The values of this community were marginalized in the wake of establishing and expanding Israeli territory. The boy is bullied by his classmates at school for his distinct identity. The film vividly exemplifies the internal ethnic identity tensions that the people experience within the multi-layered Israeli community. The formation of Israel led to the arrival and recognition of many ethno-religious communities. So uh, some of the key um, features or issues discussed in this, uh, in this film are, uh, it vividly exemplifies the internal ethnic identity, then it uh, depicts the trauma of Israeli children, then it depicts separation wall as safety measures or shield for Israelites and apartheid wall for Palestinians. It questions the indoctrinated history and instills xenophobia in young generation. Then 
uh, it uh, shows a sense of shared destiny in the identity crisis and suppression faced by Israeli minorities and Palestinians. The next next film, the last film. Uh, Fasan, you I can move towards this, the conclusion now. Yes. You yes. can just yeah, briefly so last, tell about it and move towards the conclusion. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the last film uh, which I discussed in my uh, work is uh, Farah Nablusi's Palestinian short film, The Present. So the uh, uh, it is about, it is a heart rendering um, portrayal of the daily life of Palestinians under Israeli occupation. It narrates the story of resilience of father and daughter who are subjected to numerous um, indignities and humiliations while crossing Israeli checkpoint to buy a gift for their mother. So uh, the key um, uh, issues discussed in this film are it depicts suffocating and crowded checkpoint uh, 300 with thousands of Palestinians trying to cross it to reach their workplace or home. It uh, depicts how Palestinians are dehumanized by Zionist soldiers. Then uh, it shows the differences in opinion within Israeli community regarding the treatment of Palestinians. It shows the trauma of Palestinian children, and it also shows the potentials of the young Palestinian children. So uh, hence this study traces the transition of themes and the way alterity in memory and identity were addressed by the Israeli and Palestinian filmmakers in their recent films. Uh, the archetypal innocent child protagonist in the Israeli and Palestinian movies have become a floating uh, memory site uh, which transcends space and time. The, the phrase site of memory coined by French historian Perry Nora refers uh, or evoke memory to estimate, uh, assimilate to a collective or shared knowledge of the past to which a group sense of uh, individual identity is defined. Uh, this paper identified the child characters existing in the virtual realm cinema, uh, cinema uh, as memory sites to sustain the traces of past catastrophe. This study has explained how memory sites called child protagonists in select post-millennial uh, uh, Holocaust and Nakba movies had, tried, had become virtual heterotopias. Uh, heterotopia is a concept by uh, Michel Foucault, which we all know. And the uh, uh, child characters have become a disturbing, intense, co contradictory, and transforming other space uh, within the authentic mainstream narratives. So I conclude by saying that uh, it can be understood that the socio-political aspect of Israelites and Palestinian identities construction is based on their interaction as two distinct societies characterized by political polarization, phobia, and hostility. Most of the recent children's films promotes unlearning the indoctrinated national memory to relearn the nuance within the multidirectional Israeli-Palestinian community, promoting a peaceful coexistence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Farsana, for a brilliant paper and such an important one to uh, whatever is said on the matter is always less I feel so um, I would like to speak more and give my comments but I would also like to engage uh, a short Q&A session since we are running very uh, low on time Stephen maybe you can uh, propose yeah. a short question yeah we'll just take a one question to for, mm -hmm. for Farsana which is that you know in what way does your analysis or study you know propose to bridge the gap in the existing trauma st studies the way you mentioned uh, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, PTSD, you know, to adequately understand and address the unique psychological impact on both Palestinian and Israeli children affected by the this Nakba genocide and the Holocaust memory. So how, how do you try to address that question from the lens of PTSD? Actually, uh, um, addressing this question from the lens of PTSD itself is limiting because mm -hmm. um, it is a Western 
theory uh, uh, which could uh, define the uh, tra traumatization or the traumatic condition of the um, second generation Holocaust victims. Whereas in the case of Palestinian victims or Palestinian memory bearers, the case is different because the Palestinian children face at least uh, uh, five wars within a decade uh, where they don't have a um, gap to um, um, to understand the trauma within themselves because they, they have to overcome it one after the other. So um, we cannot uh, define it within the Western frameworks. So we'll have to find a new framework to define uh, the trauma of uh, the global South. Very interesting, Fasana. Looking forward to this as a paper. Very interesting perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fasana, for a brilliant answer. And I do believe you're thinking in the right direction. Um, with this, the session is coming to a close. Before I formally leave, I would like to thank our lovely presenters, Natasha, Sanya, and Farsana, our moderator, Stephen, and our rapporteur, Samya, for coming together and making this session such a huge success. Uh, thank you also for the organizers for having me here, and of course, our audience for your continued interest and presence. This closes the session. We meet again for a very interesting keynote at 4.50. See you all again very soon, and thank you. Um. We'll take a short 10-minute uh, break and uh, we'll reconvene uh, in 10 minutes for the keynote session. Please stay logged in. Bahana, hi there. Hello, sir. Yes, hello, sir. You've already joined us. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, I just meant to get a cup of tea. Yeah, I've been here all morning, but I just meant to have a cup, cup of tea. Um, let me see. So... Is that going to work? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see if I can share. Um, uh, sir, I'll just quickly make you the co-host. And, and then uh, so we can try. The co-host. Yeah. Yeah, we can try uh, these technicalities, but uh, so we officially start in uh, around eight to nine minutes. That's yeah. absolutely right. Yeah, no, yeah. I understand that. I just wanted to check that I can share my screen because yes, we don't use yes. Zoom so much in England. Um, okay. Uh... <clears throat>